thanks, Jade. It's just hit record. So we've actually started without the recording, but we'll fix that. So having said that tonight, what we're going to really look at is how do we hone that within our teams for us that are sitting within leadership positions? Now, I thought it was quite important for me to, yes, we need to trust research from, from credible sources, but have we actually stopped to ask ourselves the question, why would a skill like creativity and innovation be important? So I thought to kick us off this evening, we'll actually look at the why, and we are very familiar and comfortable with the Simon Sinek view of starting with your why. Um, and I've given you a couple of reasons here. So what I'd really like to ask you as a leader to do is as we progress throughout this afternoon, really then ask yourself the question, is this something that I'm after within my work environment? So am I concerned with things like talent retention, um, creating great efficiency? We all know, um, and coming from corporate, you've got to do a lot more with a lot less. Um, and more and more is going to be demanded on us as leaders to get more from our teams. Are we concerned with increased productivity, promoting collaboration, improving problem solving and having a competitive advantage. If you're going to answer yes to more than one of those questions, then I think you've already answered the question as to why creativity and innovation is going to become important for you as a leader to, to grapple with. So from that perspective, understanding why, I think it will also be quite important for us to look at. Um, I'm just sorry about that. I think our slides have just stopped sharing. Am I? Are you guys still seeing the slides? Can I just get an indication? Um, okay, so we can't see the slides. Okay, so I'm just not just sure. Sorry about that. Thanks, Cindy. I'm just not just sure why that dropped. Just give me one sec. Okay. I'm just not sure if that was my connection, so give me two seconds to just fix this. And yep, this is the likes of technology for you. <laughs> Are we back? Kazi, okay, yeah, they loaded. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's just started at slide one again. So already no problem. Let's just quickly move that along. I have just no idea what just happened there. Okay, so where are we? We there? You guys can see this? Yeah, right, that's where we were? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Good. It's rock and roll. I've got to make up five minutes here. Right, so um, that's where we ended. So, so really looking at, um, and I know for myself sitting in a leadership position, those are the questions that I constantly find myself grappling with. Um, and from that perspective, you might not term creativity and innovation um, necessarily within that construct, but that's what we're going to uncover tonight is what is it creativity and innovation exactly? Um, and just if you're looking at your screen right now, what I have there is if you look at a couple of hidden letters, what you might find is that our brain would try and fill in the blanks within those and see a particular word. If I may ask you to just use the chat at this section, what exactly do you think is the hidden letters that are displayed there? Any takers? You even can put on your microphone if you like. Be creative. Cool, thanks, Jean-Marie. Correct the hidden box thinking is to be creative. That's also some really good examples. So that's what everybody saw, right? Could this be what you've seen? Did anybody see a couple of gibberish letters? Yes, no? I think everybody still will be creative. So the idea here is, and this is just a very uh, sage, the idea here is to really look at if there's sometimes we've got very limited information um, within a certain setting or within a certain problem, we try and go back to or revert back to something that we know. And that's exactly how we can relate to creativity. So past knowledge, past experience allows us to look at a problem or situation from that lens and try and solve it that way. And the concept of creativity really tonight, what we want to uncover is, is how do I look at things very differently? 
um, what is the possibility? Um, Albert Einstein did say that true intelligence is not really about knowledge, it's about imagination. So I'm really going to ask us tonight is to try and challenge the status quo and ask the question why. And before we do, let's first start off with, so what is the definition of creativity? Now, if you have your phones with you, you can Google it at this particular time, but there's a host of examples out there that defines creativity, but there's not necessarily one that is uniform. So I wanted to share a couple with, uh, with you, um, and this is just really based on our own research that we've done. Um, but you'll see that these mental processes involved is the process of being able to think of things differently, but also that our original ideas have to actually add value. Otherwise, you might just be daydreaming. Um, I do particularly want to share one with you, which is from Dr. Linda Nyman, which is the very first one you see on your screen. And I think for me, for where we find ourselves in business right now, this has really captured it really brilliantly. Um, and she says, and if you look at that very first green box on your screen. It says creativity is the act of turning new and imaginative ideas into reality. Creativity is characterized by the ability to perceive the world in new ways, to find hidden patterns, to make connections between seemingly unrelated phenomena and to generate solutions. Creativity also involves two processes. It is about thinking and producing. So it's not what we typically see creatives looking, staring out of a window, thinking up ideas. That's one component of it. But there's still some logic that has to apply to make meaning of that idea. And secondly, we've got to actually produce something at the end of it. Um, otherwise, we are actually just, just dreaming up. And that's exactly what a lot of people that sit within the creative industry are starting to understand. A concept will remain a concept unless we produce something that's tangible or intangible, but it has to be useful and meaningful. And so for you tonight as a leader, I think that is one of the key takeaways that I'd like to share with you is how am I looking at the world in a very different way, but ensuring that what I'm thinking up in terms of a solution is able to go and add value back within my working environment. So from that perspective, if that is what we are saying is the um, definition of creativity. How is it that we are able to then go and develop it? And so there's a couple of ways, right? Um, and I think from that perspective, before I look at those four ways that we can um, develop that creativity, I think it's important for us to also realize that we're all born with creative potential. Now, when we were much younger, and really for those of you in the room that are parents that have toddlers that start asking questions, in any given day, you get the question why potentially 120 to 150 times. That's what research says. Um, and the older we get and we progress through life, we start asking the question why a lot less. And particularly when we find ourselves in school, um, you get probably a quota of whys that you can ask before you get answered because we said so or because I told you so. And I think that's where we start and untapping our own creativity as adults, but it is something that we can unlearn and relearn how to actually tap into it. So on your screen, you'll see that there's four different ways in which you can do so. Um, really, you can develop your creativity from an individual perspective, um, which is really the first little icon there. And you can do so by doing things like um, online courses, um, doing research, ensuring that you, you remain current in terms of reading. That will allow you to start filling your mind with different ideas and thoughts that are that are unbiased potentially to your own views. You're also able to untap your or tap into your creativity in a sort of team setting. And this is in, within the work environment. We find this quite often. We work in cross functional teams with people that are very different to ourselves and from different backgrounds, which forces us again to reflect on our own worldview when faced with a situation or, or, or problem. Tonight, very key example and a very visual example is being in a peer setting. So when you choose to be in a community like open source with Omni or any other kind of alumni session that you're part of, being a, around like minded individuals doesn't mean we are the same because we do come from different backgrounds, but it does allow us to be able to learn from each other. And last but not least, I think young people Okay, I'll say this very lightly and tongue in cheek, 
but I've been exposed to this more often. And the last one is augmented creativity. So we see that a lot in online gaming where we work with the, or play within a virtual reality world. And so our young people are much more comfortable to be able to operate within the imaginative than if you are potentially in the baby boomer generation. So from, from the perspective of being able to look at um, how it is that we are able to tap into our creativity, and I've mentioned this now a few times, that we are all different. As a leader, I think what is one of the key things that, that I've just learned in my journey as well is there's no way we can treat any two people alike, even if they are from the same generation. So in terms of the personal components around creativity, you'll see on your screen right now, the untapped potential for creativity actually sits within the middle of an individual construct. Um, Jean-Marie, I'm going to just ask us to, can I just ask us to pose that poll for just one second and just go through this quickly? Um, so you'll see that it actually sits within the center. But our expertise, our background, our educational history might be very different from a technical perspective. Um, our motivation to want to be creative will also be quite individual. So am I motivated by intrinsic, um, from an intrinsic perspective or from an extrinsic perspective? Now, for us as leaders, we do need to understand motivating with anything as a reward externally is not necessarily sustainable. That lasts for as long as what that reward is still valuable to the individual. For someone to truly exercise their creativity in the workplace, there has to be a component of internal willingness to want to work with. And that's what we've actually got to tap into. And the third component from a personal perspective is we all learn creative skills differently. So if I take you back to one previous slide, these four ways in which you can learn how to be creative, that for us as leaders is how do I harness each individual very uniquely to get the best out of them to ensure that they're able to work together towards a particular situation that we're trying to solve within our environments. So, so from a personal perspective, that for us as leaders is quite important to get. Now, in the same breath, there's no two humans that is the same. And I think this is the fundamental component from a why that cannot be replicated by artificial intelligence or even robotics, is our ability to operate within a specific construct. Now, we don't have um, robot humans, we have individuals that all operate within a environment like the workspace. Um, and within this context, you'll see at the top, which is the, the last component I want to talk to you about. Understanding your team member well, knowing how they think, how they operate and what motivates them, tick one step in the right direction. But very important, if the environment in the team with, in which we operate in the organizational culture does not support or foster the concept of creativity, or the, the concept of people being able to speak up or challenge the status quo, do you think that creativity is going to be alive and kicking and well, even if people are internally motivated? The answer is no. And that's where we see um, high attrition and the likes of what we're seeing globally now with, with the great resignation. People are leaving when the environment is no longer conducive for them to operate. And it actually has nothing to do with my ability to be creative or not. I'm just not comfortable that I'm able to challenge my manager or challenge my leader to improve a process or a system. So you understand that whilst I'm dealing with an individual, I'm dealing with an individual and teams within a specific context. And if the context is not conducive or toxic in any which way or doesn't allow for constructive communication and debate, our organization is not going to move forward. And I know often, um, Cult, the concept of culture is not always within our control, but as a leader, how are we influencing that culture to allow people to see beyond just that? So if I can just pause at this section here, I know um, our team has popped a poll into the chat. If we can quickly just have a look at that. And, and I think really the question here on the table was, are some people born more creative than others? Yes, no, or we're unsure. Um, and the second question is, um, I think they're still going to pop that in a second, would be really around, is, is creativity a skill that can be developed? Yes or no? And I think if you're still answering no at this stage, then perhaps I didn't necessarily land some of the concepts very well in the beginning. But there you have it on your screen now. Thanks, Jean-Marie. Oh, so, sorry, thanks, Jade. Guys, what is your thoughts? Can creativity 
um, as a skill be learned? Yes. No. What is your thoughts that you'll find on your screen right now? We'd really love to hear from you. Thanks so much. Alrighty, votes are coming in. Can it be learned? Absolutely. Is some that says maybe. Perfect. To the members in the room that said that maybe creativity skills can be learned. I absolutely do agree with you. Um, and the reason why I would like to agree with you, if I can just take you back to one slide here, the individual still has to make a conscious choice as to whether or not they want to learn or not learn. Um, can I just ask for mics to be muted, if I can just ask our teams to sort that out? Yeah, so absolutely agree with you. It is a maybe. But for us as leaders, I think if we do want to take on the responsibility around being able to motivate and encourage and go back to the why it is important, we can only but encourage um, individuals to do so. But if that internal motivation for me to learn a new skill is not there, then you're 100% spot on with that answer. But to the 90% the of the room that said yes, absolutely, you can actually develop the skill of creativity. So from that perspective, Lisa, oh sorry, Leanda, I'm not seeing your slides. Are you seeing the slide now that says innovation is the implementation perfect? It might just be a bit of a delay on your side, Leanda. Awesome. So just for where we are now, guys, um, we've covered, okay, so creativity is around thinking up ideas, being able to generate a host of ideas, and using our mental processes to do so, and ensuring that our end result is a, a thought that is able to be produced that is tangible, meaningful, and useful. We also agreed and looked at so far that there's a couple of ways in which you're able to build your creative muscle, um, if we can call it that, and you can do so individually, in a team context, or in a peer context. We're not treating people the same, but we understand we're operating within a context that ensures that we are able to foster that environment that allows people to, to dream um, and to actually think up ideas that is non-conventional. At this stage, what is innovation really? Now, often people use innovation and creativity side by side as if it's the same thing. It actually isn't, but the one can't exist without the other. Now, we said that creativity is about creating ideas and generating ideas. Innovation is about actually making it happen. So implementing a new product or re-engineering a product or improving a process. Doesn't mean that it's perfect or that it's going to be successful, but you're actually doing something about what it is that you've thought about and not just left those ideas on a piece of paper. And that really is the art of using both of those interchangeably. So from a business context, if I'm, let's use some of example, needing to reduce a departmental budget by 20%, and so we've got to look at how to work leaner, if that is the problem statement, we can get a host of team members to come up with ideas of how to do that. Cool. Those ideas are going to be nothing unless we try and actually go and do something about it and have a look and then measure that result to see whether or not anything has changed, has it improved, or how to actually go back and refine some of the ideas that we have come up with as a team. So from those two concepts, really, that is how they go hand in hand. I can be creative and actually just do nothing or be creative and do something about it and ensure that I'm actually improving my working environment. Um, I think I've covered this year. We are going creativity goes hand in hand with, with innovation. And at this stage, if you really go back to that question I asked in the very beginning, why is important? I do want to just pause here for a second because I don't think it's something that we can actually argue we don't need to learn this or it's not something that we, we should take away and go and apply. And the reason I want to argue quite strongly that innovation and creativity is important for us for where we find ourselves within our organizations and countries specifically, no longer are we able to solve problems the same way we've done them five, ten years ago. Um, if COVID has taught us anything and the positive we can take away is that problems need to be solved in a much faster manner with a different mindset, with the mindset that actually we are able to come up with solutions to help business recover, 
Um, we're still seeing a lot of the backlash of, of COVID in terms of economic recovery. And so how are we going to turn things around? Think things up, but actually go and apply it to in order to move us forward. So at this stage, before I move on to enabling factors, I'm going to just ask Jade if you're online, is there anything that I may have missed in the chat? Because I do know that's been quite busy. Um, Dion sharing quite a bit of graphics with us. Dion's also in the creative industry, so we do know him from a schooling perspective. Dion, thanks so much for that. Um, Jade, is there anything that I've missed? We don't actually have any questions cool. coming through, Kaz. Just a lot of statements um, from everyone, so that's really nice to see. Um, but if you would maybe like to answer a question that has to do with sort of hierarchical processes, um, in terms of supervisors who often reject innovative ideas due to hierarchical structures that tend to adapt slowly to changing needs. Um, I mean, and this often hinders an organization's sort of um, speed to change. How do you have any advice in terms of how does one overcome these processes without hamper, hampering the freedom and creativity of the individual who comes to the supervisor with this creative idea? Hmm. It's a very loaded question. Um, I think from from that perspective, we are. And if I can, sorry, guys, I know that I'm skipping through my slides here, but I just want to quickly take you quite um, back Jay, to answer that question. We are still operating within an organizational construct. So um, in large multinationals um, and very large corporates, the structure in the reality is it still is very hierarchical, um, very siloed, very decentralized in some instances. And so as a leader or supervisor, we do need to understand that construct. I'm not saying things can't change, but what is it that you can control within the space that you are managing? And so from that perspective, Really, that place does not necessarily mean place from a macro perspective. That place can also be within my team, whether or not your team is quite minute or very large, but how am I controlling and, and fostering an environment there in which we are able to, to help improve the situation or the problems that we are facing within our team? Granted, if we are now talking about big business problems, obviously this naturally um, a way in which you're escalating those those um, ideas from your teams. And again, I think I don't have the, the correct answer or the, the full detailed answer to give you. But if organizations are going to be slow to adapt, and we've seen this and there's many case studies about it, organizations are being slow to adapt and not building growth strategies alongside business as usual are the ones that are going to become obsolete, less and less relevant, and are going to be taken over by organizations that are able to manage both those strategies at the same time. So, so from that perspective, really, I do think from a leader, control that in which you can control in the space in which you're in. Try and influence, that will be my encouragement. But organizations also have to start looking at, from an organizational perspective, how are we creating this environment that allows us to create channels where our teams can provide suggestions for improvement, or ideas, how's that being managed? Um, and so it's not very, it's not a very linear answer I'm providing, but it also was a bit of a loaded question. So I hope that gives you some context there, Jade. Um, what would be the consequences of being complacent, if not innovating, maintaining the status quo? Um, yeah, Lisa, 100%. I think that is exactly, if we just go back to just what Jade has just asked, if we are going to remain complacent, we are just going to become irrelevant. And so we are going to find that jobs naturally are already changing. And I'm going to quickly skip back to where we are now um, in terms of enabling factors, and hopefully that addresses your question, Lisa, around complacency. But what is it that enables creativity within an environment? We've just spoken about corporate culture continuously. So again, it's not coming from a singular department or single unit. Corporate culture is a is within the organization. So what is being bred there? Um, secondly, businesses also have to go and choose the right ideas to implement. So not moving, which is not being innovative, and that's being, being complacent, means that actually I'm just potentially not going to keep up um, and not generate any revenue or being able to compete within the environment in which your business operates. 
So not all ideas can ever be implemented. I just don't think there's the time nor the money within organizations to do so. But selecting the right one has to be quite critical and has to ask, answer a couple of questions. So does this idea improve performance? Um, does it enhance a product or service that we're currently offering? And, and is it what our customers want? Um, and the shift really here for business is starting to become more human and customer centric compared to what we think our customers need. And I think that really goes right back to put out an MVP change. Um, for those of you that don't know what that is, it's, it's a minimum viable product. Um, and that can be a minimum viable change to a process or system. Check it out. We're not going to know if it works until the end user actually uses it, critiques it, provides us with feedback, which allows us internally to actually go and improve on that and put out another version of it. That's where the concepts of sprints and being quite agile is birthed from. It's being able to be quite fearless in the way in which we operate um, and go and implement that change. Again, the disclaimer I want to make these, we are operating within a construct. So please do understand um, what that means within the organizational context within, in which you operate. Okay. So Liz, if that answers you there, if we're going to choose again, make the choice to not move, we are going to be left behind. There's just absolutely no way things are going to just change automatically. So from that perspective, leaders, what can you do to foster that environment? Um, of creativity. And I do think it does start with us. We we do set the example um, and we set the pace for the environment in which we want our teams to actually mimic the behavior that we are looking for. So I've given you six tips here um, and please don't be startled at the first one. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, in fact, um, I think we've got about 11 or 12 um, more detailed tips that will be in one of our modules on our online platform. But I felt these were quite generic and relevant for where we are. So if I can run through this with you very quickly, um, the first one says never say no. Um, and really, that doesn't mean don't say no verbally. It is around being able for us to also be able to control our nonverbal cues when we sit within an information session or an ideation session. So being very mindful and conscious of what words I say. Am I sending any signals to go, Mm, that idea is probably not going to work. Um, so what am I saying? Or am I actually just listening and encouraging ideas to actually flow, flow comfortably? And I think the key takeaway for me here is what am I saying? How am I saying it? Or what is my expressions? But also I need to listen. Um, and that is our role is to really hear what our teams are saying. From a diversity perspective, you can look at this in two ways to um, really foster that either via your recruitment and selection processes. Um, and that's really looking at people that are very different. They might have the technical expertise. Guys, we can develop creative skills. We've just agreed to that. But if someone's really motivated, we can harness that. So recruitment and selection is quite critical to diversifying your team. But if it's not about recruitment, how am I putting non-conventional teams together in sort of a subcommittee or a subset of a team to go and really look at focus creatively on a problem. Put introverts and extroverts together, put people from finance together with the creative team. We look at things very differently, either from a left or, or right brain perspective. And that is quite important to be able to do so. Um, creative abrasion is another important one when we look at diversity in teams. It's okay to have conflict. It is okay to very strongly butt heads and disagree about something as long as we've created the foundation around how we engage to ensure that we are not discounting individuals, but that we are still focusing on the end product or solution that we're trying to, trying to solve. Um, thirdly, another good tip for us as leaders, um, we don't want people to check the individuality at the door when we're working on a team problem. So we want people to actually be quite uniquely different and it's okay to be the only one in the room that sees not be creative, but see saw the gibberish. Um, that's fine, and we do want that, because without us having individuals within the room, we're going to be producing a lot of the same result. Um, fourthly, and this is a very important tip, um, I don't know if you've ever had the whole, right, let's have a meeting, and we need to come up with some creative ideas to improve this process. Sometimes sufficient time is required to allow for people to think up and ponder upon what it is that you're after. 
Um, we also have people that very from an individual perspective are more reflectors. So they need the time to hear, absorb, go away, change environments and come back. And I think often we do put ourselves under a huge amount of pressure when we want to solve all problems now within an hour online meeting. It's just not possible. But are we able to create the space and the environment to do so? I think the other important, important point here at tip number four, guys, if you're having a meeting in a boardroom and it needs to be a blue sky thinking session, is that set up conducive to allow people to think out of the box? So changing a setup just from where you find yourself having a meeting under the tree or um, around a coffee station just allows people to shift their perspective very differently. So this is something that we do have to think of as leaders when we are wanting to, again, harness individuals to come up with creative and innovative ideas. Fifthly, um, learn from your mistakes. And I think, yeah, when we've just spoken before around releasing an MVP out into the world, yes, not everything is going to work. And yes, sometimes we might fail at something. But I do think from an environmental perspective, it's not about consequence management when something didn't work or there was a mistake. What can we learn from it? What can we take away? What can we improve and what can we do differently? Now, I know that's a bit of a challenging one, depending on the industry you might be in. Um, because it's also risk mitigation that we've got to worry about. But I do think if we are able to encourage our teams to be able to fail forward, um, be able to reflect on, okay, so what did you learn? Yes, there might still be consequence management if that needs to happen, but it, the way in which we are managing that conversation is very differently. And last but not least, um, the sixth step I would like to give you is, is to provide freedom and empowerment. Um, there's nothing more limiting than not providing people with access to information or access to resources. They've got to solve problems, but um, you might not get access to some policies or you don't you restricted access to certain drives where you find information. And I think, again, if we just look at those six tips, those are very doable for us within the working environment to go and implement tomorrow. Um, and for and actually demonstrating that behavior from an example perspective will automatically also provide our teams to be a lot more at ease to be able to go, okay, wait, hold on. I've got the space and the freedom here to speak and I'm being heard. And I think if I can leave that six tips with you today, um, if anything, and you forget everything else, is go and apply that and just see what the result is in terms of the feedback you receive back. So for where we find ourselves now, this is the fun part um, in terms of what we're going to be covering next. So please stay on the line with us, um, engage. I do think this is going to be an in-practice principle, um, which we've not done in previous um, open source sessions. So I'm going to take you through that in just a sec. I just want to have a look at David King. Processing is very necessary for some, 100%. Empower your team to push boundaries and challenge your thinking, psychological safety. Absolutely spot on. I think that's a, it's a very um, big topic that's come out um, throughout the last two years, which is around psychological safety. Um, and again, I think if we are going to demonstrate that behavior, it's going to allow people to feel safe, to be able to ask the challenging and tough questions. Be in mind, if we are opening up that door or pr providing that platform, as leaders, we also have to be comfortable with what that feedback might be or what those questions might be. And not at that stage when it becomes too uncomfortable for us, actually change the rules and go, well, no, um, email me instead. So I do think, yeah, um, boundaries is quite important, um, but I do think very importantly, have a construct, have team rules of engagement. How how would we like conflict to be handled? And, and if we have those, I do think that's going to be a, a risk before absolute success within your teams being able to be creative and, and innovative. So at this junction, um, we are going to be doing a group activity. And what's going to happen right now, we've got a couple of our teams um, that's behind the scenes that's going to help me manage the session. But for all of us that are in the room, we're going to be broken up into a couple of breakout rooms. And what I'd like you to do is, and hopefully if you are still at the office or even at home, I don't actually have one with me, but if you have a tangible bulldog clip that you can find, if not, please just imagine what it feels like. 
but this has been designed for a specific reason. I have no idea when this bulldog clip was designed, um, but we all know what it is. And it's, be, it's been designed to actually hold paper, mass amounts of paper. I think it might have been before the heavy duty stapler was designed potentially. But that's the primary purpose of why that bulldog clip was designed. And your task right now when you get into your breakout room is you're going to have five minutes in which you need to think about this product. And if you were part of that project product engineering team and had to think of what else we could sell that as, what else we could use it for, what would you say? So in that five minutes, you need to come up with as many options as you possibly can. And we will come back within five minutes and look at what was probably the wackiest, most creative ideas that you could have come up with. So if that's okay, I'm going to move you over and you'll have someone that's going to, oh, there we've got Cindy going, Google says it was first designed. I just want to have a look at what she said. Um, Google says it was first designed in 1910. <laughs> Cindy, I, I have no idea. That's like, like many years ago. So at this stage, we're going to move over if that's okay. And your team leads are going to chat to you about just coming up with some ideas. Okay, so... At this stage, there's quite a few of our team that said, <laughs> David, <laughs> David King, I have no idea what's happening. So I think let's just do this. How about we just open up the for the floor? Um, and if anybody has any ideas, you can talk to me or pop it into the chat. You've obviously had time to Google. I really hope that you were honest and didn't do so. But... John Marie, I can see you on screen. Sorry, I'm going to pick on you. What exactly would you say you'd use that bulldog, bulldog clip for? Well, Kaz, for me, a bulldog clip is a very, very versatile piece of equipment, um, and it has many great uh, characteristics. And you could honestly use it for anything from trying to block off a pipe, uh, keep wires together. You could even use it as... Um, I don't know, maybe uh, a, a conductor with a battery, maybe your cable's broken, you need to connect your terminals, and Bob's your uncle, there's your so plan many, B. So many ideas. That's really fantastic. Awesome. Is there anybody else that would be comfortable to share with us? Jade, are you there? Let me just pick on the people that I know is on the call. <laughs> <laughs> Ian says, close the open bag of grounded coffee tightly. Yeah, because we do that at the office. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> um, I'd also like to share Cassandra. Go for it, Vicky. Um, I actually noted a couple of them down. I would use it as a curtain clipper, a hair clip. I would use it as a plastic bag sealer. You know, we open cereals. You yes. can use it as a sealer and a cool use it as an equal airtime tool in training. So when you've got the bulldog clip, you speak. If you're Love not carrying it, it <laughs> you don't speak. Have you done this activity before? No, it's actually the first time. I do want to steal the, the curtain one because I, I think that's pretty unique. That's really awesome. awesome. Thank you for sharing. Do you have any other ideas there? Um, No, nothing else from my side, but that was so exciting. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. I'm happy. I'm happy that you've done that. Who else is willing to put their mics on and tell us what else they'd use it for? So we've got heat clip, cable tie holder, um, curtain, hold your curtains back, close your coffee. Um, what else have I missed? Jay, what did you say? Did you tell me something? I didn't, but I can share with you, um, I really like sort of like interior design and decorating in the house. So what I have actually used it before for is taking some press stick, putting it at the back of the bulldog clip, sticking it to the wall and then threading through my fairy lights so that it just, ah. yeah, I'm able to do that all around the room instead oh, wow. of putting the press stick to the fairy lights because it can be really thin. So I'd need something to kind of like mount it or hold it together. And the fairy lights is quite light. So it's yes. not exactly going to weigh it down. That's mm -hmm. really awesome. So you kind of like thread it through. Yeah. That's fab. 
That's really I, awesome. Yeah, I remember also when we um, actually ran the session with our teams at Omni, someone also said a, which I thought was quite cool, one of our team members, um, you could use it as a toothpaste, like pusher. Mm. So you put it at the end of the toothpaste <laughs> and you kind of like roll it up so that the toothpaste end of the month, to come the end. end of the month, salty crack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a really awesome idea. Um, cheers, Emmy. Thanks for joining us. Um, anybody else on night still? Um, I'm just trying to get our tech team. If there was people that disappeared, that needs to just come back into the main room that they sort that out for us. Um, Sharon, are you there? Did we did we cover absolutely everything? Okay, as I need it for my eat today. <laughs> Any I other think ideas that you'd use it for? I think that possibly um, when I heard Vika speaking about curtain, I often step on my own hem, my pants. I'm definitely going to consider a small one next time and color it in black. <laughs> you can give me all sorts of colors. I'm sure you can. Exactly. You can. Um, I will I I'll use it for, if you look at the one, on the screen on your on your slide i would possibly um hang my keys at the bottom and and tie that on my on my pants That's and to good. hold it that is I, you, think, you think you can tie it here and then hang mm. your keys that little round thingy on the key can hang mm. i think dion possibly use something like that guess <laughs> And then i saw when i googled because i told you to google they actually use it in the fridge for the bottles and they put the bottles down the beer bottles case so that so that you can lie it flat on the rack guys that's an idea i think if i were to build on bk's one um you can possibly also hold down i don't know if depending on how broad your table is or how big your bulldog clip is but you could probably hold a tablecloth in place as well mm. yeah that's you could another idea and clip those two yeah. little clips underneath that table and the color ones could make it look quite nice, I think. Can you imagine the color ones with your um, with your fairy lights in between? It will look nice. Guys, that is like absolutely amazing. Who's on screen now? Da that's David. Another David David is trying to David is trying to beat my beer one. I know it. I'm sure. I'm sure we're all back. <laughs> awesome. For those okay. of you that missed the main, we didn't all go into breakouts. I have no idea if we are influenced by the, the weather today and our technical challenges. But for those of that you were in some sub teams, Mario, I know you said you guys had um, a breakout with some people in it. Any wacky ideas you'd like to share with us? Yes, I was in your room. <laughs> Lisa was managing the one that I was listening to. Oh, was she? Okay, then Lisa, <laughs> we'd like to hear from you. What did you guys come up with? Did you solve a world problem with the bulldog clip? That's a very good example of delegation where there's no official um, role clarification. But, okay, I'll share. There were some creative ideas. So, first of all, it's... Um, to close packets, to hold it, close coffee, chips, um, pasta packets, whatever. Then um, also when you have, when you need the weights for a tablecloth as an example, so that a tablecloth doesn't blow off, you can use it as that. You can use it as cufflings, as a, um, a tie clip. Um, you can use it as an emergency button for your trousers. Mm -hmm. You can use it as a hair clip. A hair replacement for those of us that's got long hair. That's a very easy way to, to use it. And then I think our final comment, if my memory serves me correct, and team, you can just um, comment here as well if I didn't cover everything, is just to say, if you are in the business of manufacturing the clips, because we use paperless, you might have to go into a process of a creative brainstorm or think tank to look at how do you re-engineer your product to be more relevant because paper is being used less and everything is more electronic. So that was a closing comment I think we made. Did I cover everything, team? No idea where your team is. Well, I got a thumbs up. A thumbs up. That is really phenomenal. Now, 
I think, and thank you so much for engaging us even with the challenges in doing this. Thanks, Jean-Marie, Jade, PK, Sharon, Lisa. Really appreciate it. I think if we just reflect on what we've just done, um, and I just actually want to quickly take us back um, to, if I can just quickly jump, I don't know, I'm going back to, to this slide around um, the components of creativity. We, we were all in the same place, <laughs> not necessarily, but we were within different settings. Each of us were in that room with very different thought processes, so individual. We had to think about and generate that ideas very differently at speed, or some of us are still reflecting, or we used a tool to actually research. But the product we focused on was that tangible bulldog clip. So in practice, what we've just done using a very silly example was when certain of those elements were out of sync, there were some stumbling blocks. We potentially had some challenges to get started. However, we all knew what was the end, what was the end result here that we needed to achieve. We had to think of how else we wanted to use that bulldog clip other than holding paper together. That was the solution we were trying to solve. And even with all the other challenges, unless they all sort of came together at some point, but we were also motivated to want to solve that problem, none of this would have actually happened. You guys could have decided this is a waste of time um, and actually just bounce out of the call um, because you, didn't, you weren't motivated to do this. And so there's a very practical example of how each of those elements have got to work together and we've got to ensure that that environment is conducive for individuals to want to generate those ideas. And so that just kind of solidifies for us where we are this evening as we wrap up is that I want to leave you with a couple of just thoughts in terms of summary. We've spoken about this evening around the concept of creativity, and it's really about generating ideas using both left, right brain thinking, which culminates in us thinking outside of the box, which is actually coined as the term lateral thinking. Innovation actually cannot be seen in isolation from creativity. So innovation is around implementing those brilliant ideas that you come up with for either a tangible or an intangible product. Thirdly, we all have creative potential. We've just case in point showed that in that activity now. It really is up to us as individuals to want to harness that muscle and figure out how we're going to do so. Now, we don't all have to go back to school and study, but being within different setups, teams, in a peer setting like today, we are able to actually work that muscle to think differently about a solution, a situation or problem. Fourthly, leaders, it's really up to us to create that environment. And that's what we just covered in terms of that four P's in terms of the components that we need to have in place. It is our role to ensure that the culture, the process, the construct in which we are operating in really comes together in a way that we can bring the best out in our, in our teams. And last but certainly not least, um, and I think this is my most favorite quote that I've, I've just recently read from Dr. Linda Nyman, and she, she does a, a TED talk on um, doing multiple different um, chats with CEOs around how they are able to, to leverage creativity in organizations. And if we're not going to frame the way we see our role, that leaders are supposed to set the stage and not perform on it, we're going to find that we're going to lose our teams within the process because we should then be having all the answers. And it really isn't about us. It is about us creating that platform and environment to allow our teams to be able to shine um, and to flourish. And so that's really where I wanna end the session this evening, um, just in terms of what you can expect next. So where to from here? We've just covered the tip of the iceberg around just defining what those concepts are, um, looking at how to build creative muscle, um, and just I gave you a couple of tips for you to take away as leaders. But really, if you want to delve into this some more, and if this has piqued your interest, please go and check out um, our Disruptive Leaders module on our Omni Stack. Guys, they are at a nominal price. So if you really want to just chat us about doing some activity for your team, if that's something that you're after, we're very welcome and very happy to support you in doing so. But most importantly, I do want to share with you, we are back here next month. Um, and Mario Pepino, that actually is on this call, my colleague, he'll be joining us um, at the end of June. It's the last Wednesday. Mario, I forget the date. I think it's the 29th. Um, and he's going to be talking about the power of cognitive flexibility. 
Now that really builds on today's session. So here we just covered what is creativity and innovation, and he's going to actually look at, so how are we going to take that back and actually going cognitively work on our flexibility of solving problems and looking at solutions in a very unique and different way. Thank you so much for joining me. If there's any closing comments or remarks, I'm going to be online and the team's online for the next few minutes before we close out um, this very, very busy day. So thank you very, very much.